So um, let's start off by just asking, what is a pedestal boulder? Okay, I think everybody knows what a boulder is, and uh, sometimes they can be quite large, bigger than a car or a truck or a house. Well, a pedestal boulder is supported underneath by three or more smaller stones. Now, sometimes you can get something similar with, let's say, only one or two stones, and we would term that as a propped boulder as opposed to pedestal. So the idea of pedestal is it's almost like sitting on table legs. They can be quite stunning to see these, uh, especially in the woods or in a wilderness area. And it makes you think, wow, did somebody build that? Um, now these boulders arrived here via glacial transport. Al almost all boulders in, in Nova Scotia um, had that origin because the whole place was covered by a glacier only uh, 15,000 or less years ago. So that's where the boulders came from. But what happened to them after that? Okay, here's uh, one of the more classic pedestal boulders that we have in Nova Scotia. And uh, it's called the Sibley Stone. Um, if we had two hours instead of one, I could tell you a long story about how it got to have that name and came to public attention. But uh, we're going to whip through uh, a lot of examples. So I don't want to take too much time on each one. But you can see how there's little stones underneath it holding up this fairly massive boulder here. Now, sometimes people use the expression glacial erratic. And that really doesn't mean what people think it means. In fact, uh, a glacial erratic is just any old stone or boulder that has a different type of geology from the bedrock of the area. Sometimes also people say a perched boulder. Um, you think it sounds similar, but really a perched boulder is something on the top of a cliff. It doesn't have to be pedestal or propped. So these are maybe slightly confusing terms, but if we stick to the official versions of them, it, it helps the dialogue. Here's another view of the Sibley Stone. It's quite interesting. You can see that there's kind of a bed, bedrock platform that it sits on, and it's surrounded by uh, uh, swampy land and it's 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 found um quite far from the road out uh somewhat southeast of the airport in halifax uh hrm and it's kind of hard to get to but uh it's quite stunning when you do get there so we're going to look at a few more examples of pedestal boulders from nova scotia and throw in a few from new england as well now, sometimes people do call these dolmens, and you'll, you'll see that in a lot of uh, websites and so on. We are going to discuss dolmens later. Uh, Barry Fell is the one who started this usage, and uh, so we can blame him for the, for the confusion. Um, okay, here's another shot of the Sibley Stone from a different angle. And you can really see these three uh, fairly significant pedestal stones underneath it, but they're tremendously smaller than uh, the, the capstone here. Uh, you can also see that there's there's different kind of texture on these boulders. There's kind of a smooth section that obviously has been worn by glacial transport. And then there's a fairly rough sort of uh, clean cut almost section. And, and the, the pedestals do have similar surfaces as well. Uh, glaciers are well known for a process called plucking where they can take a piece of uh, bedrock off of an outcrop and then transport it. So a lot of times these, um, these uh, fairly flat surfaces that have a rough texture are as a result of glacial plucking. All right, let's move on from the Sibley Stone and look at some more uh, examples from Nova Scotia. This is the Kidston Stone. It's also pretty famous. You'll see it on a, quite a few websites. You can see it also has three uh, pedestals and it's very massive. This is uh, in Spryfield, not far from the uh, more famous Rocking Stone, but it's it's on private land. It's not in the uh, Rocking Stone Park, but it's not that far from it. Now this one is also pretty famous around HRM, uh, the Eagle Rock in Bedford. There's a, uh, a, a rock climbing cliff right next to it so a lot of people are familiar with it and uh, 
It is more, I think it's more of a prop builder um, because it obviously has this one pedestal here, but the other ends are sort of resting on bedrock. Here is a uh, another view where you can see how the this one prop stone is uh, holding it up pretty well above the bedrock here. Now, if you go out to uh, Peggy's Cove or Poly Cove, which is the next one over, you're going to see a lot of these. They're very, very common. The Poly Cove one here is uh, quite a spectacular example because the pedestals are so close together. So it, it makes for a stunning, uh, a stunning visual. Here's another one from the Eastern Shore that uh, is best seen, I guess, from the water. I'm a kayaker here. And again, three really small pedestals uh, supporting a very large capstone. And it makes you wonder, did, did somebody prop them up there or, or is it natural? This is another one from the Peggy's Cove area. And uh, it does, you know, the, the way this is propped, it really makes you think. I wonder if somebody used a lever and stuck those smaller stones on the, under there. Now, this one only has... Uh, you can only see the two propping stones here. I'm not sure if there's a third one on the other side, but it's it's resting on bedrock on this end. Here's a quite a different sort of example. Uh, it's from down in the Mahon Bay area, but somewhat inland. And it almost creates like a, a chamber or a cave here with this uh, glacial boulder. And it's kind of unclear if, if these are part of an outcrop or if they're also boulders. And I think there's there's an outcrop underneath all of this. And so some of this might be outcrop, some of it might be boulder. There's another angle on the same one. So this one in particular is we, we're going to look at some of the true dolmens later on. And it, some of the, the true dolmens don't look all that much different from this. So it, it can be kind of confusing. Uh, similarly, here's another one where the capstone is very flat and very large. This is my meter stick here, so it's almost uh, maybe uh, over three meters long, and it's maybe two meters wide, and it's sitting fairly level on uh, some other boulders. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, when I looked in here, it almost looked like the interior had been uh, filled in. Uh, so. Uh, I'm not sure if there really was a uh, a cave there at one point that was later filled in for safety's sake. It's it's hard to know. There is a a standing stone right next to it. Obviously, somebody has has propped that up there. I'm not sure how long ago. So, just goes to show you there's there's quite a, a variety of uh, of features in in these um, um, pedestal and prop boulders. Now let's look at the geological explanation. So these pedestal boulders form as the glaciers melt and they leave behind the glacier boulders. So in some cases, these big stones end up sitting on little stone just as the ice melts. Stones can melt directly out of the glacier ice and then end up sitting on the pedestals or uh, they can come out of the till and the finer particles can be washed away at a later date. So I know some people find this hard to believe. Um, so we're going to look at some examples to try to make it more evident of what we're talking about. First of all, what is this glacier? Not everybody knows about the glacier. Um, so most of North America, or the northern half of it anyway, uh, was covered by a very large glacier up until um, maybe 15,000 years ago, it, it was reached its peak at around 25 to 21,000 years ago, and then it started to melt. But it didn't melt all, um, very quickly. It took thousands of years. Here you can see uh, around 13,000 years ago, the, a nice free corridor started to form uh, through the Yukon and the Alberta. Um, now in this part of the world, by about 13,000 years ago, uh, there was a lot of dry land or ice-free land, um, which is the green, and also um, the, I think the light blue was also land at that time. 
but the white shows where there was still ice. And okay, so eventually it all melted. <laughs> this is more like today. Well, uh, 12,000 years ago, there was still some glaciers in Newfoundland. All right, so while the glaciers are melting, rivers form within the ice. And these river beds uh, can collect the boulders together, and they also create the till uh, that can uh, then be deposited in the drumlins, which is the uh, bottom part of a glacial lake that formed in the ice, or eskers, which are the uh, remains of the river that was underneath the glacier in the ice. Here's an example uh, of a modern glacier that has a river running through it in uh, Russia and lets you sort of visualize the process that was happening uh, as the glaciers melted in this part of the world, uh, you know, maybe 12,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago. So the till that's left behind, I think most people in Nova Scotia that have done any uh, excavations or, or uh, farm work or road work, you, you've seen till before. It's just the mixture of sand and clay and, and uh, gravel and boulders that the glaciers deposited. But there's a lot of different grades of till. I mean, uh, some of it is very fine, some of it is very coarse. Now this stuff in this example has a lot of boulders in it. Um, then the, here you can see different uh, layers of till. Some of it has uh, big rocks and uh, gravel mixed in with uh, fine clay, and then it gets a little sandier. And then here it's uh, a lot more clay content. So glacial till is a complex thing. Uh, here's a boulder that in theory might end up being a prop boulder or a pedestal boulder if if the till were to wash away and leave behind some of these smaller stones. So that's the process we're talking about. So it's also possible for these uh, pedestal boulders to emerge from the ice even without any till at all or not very much. So here's an example of a uh, a glacial boulder that is being slowly melted out of this ice pedestal that's under it because it forms kind of like a sunshade. And so the ice all around it melts more quickly and the ice under it takes longer to melt. And so if there's any stones in this uh, ice underneath this boulder, they could end up as pedestals or, or uh, propping stones. There's another more dramatic example of, uh, of this happening. Uh, this one from France. This is just a, uh, a lithograph. And uh, this is a photograph, but it's uh, low res, but it's a similar, similar type thing in another area of France. I got a few more examples here just to show you that it's not a rare thing at all. They're, these are happening in glaciated areas in various parts of the world even, even today. Uh, this one is kind of uh, spectacular as the ice pillar is holding up this pretty large uh, stone and as the ice melts, could end up having pedestals under it. There's another one from that same area of Nepal. And then a few more from Switzerland. So these are just to try to convince you that it isn't uh, an impossible procedure or, or even all that rare where you have glaciers that are melting. You do end up with large stones melted down on top of smaller ones. This is a huge glacial boulder that is, I think, ending up being supported by some pedestals under there, but it's, I think there's still an ice pedestal at the moment, but it's, it's almost all melted. Now here's another curious one from Russia, which uh, a similar phenomenon uh, in Slovakia left behind this really precariously um, uh, perched boulder. I guess you'd have to call it a perched boulder or prop boulder even. 
It's definitely perched. Is it propped? It's prop. Maybe it's not propped because I guess that's just a a bedrock outcrop. So we'll, we'll just say it's it's perched. <laughs> but you get the idea. Like these things are uh, are amazing, but natural. Oh, here's another example of a very large boulder coming out of the till, and so it could end up being uh, pedestaled in the end if there are some stones in that till that can hold it up. We'll quickly look at a few more examples. Um, this is one of the iconic ones, the balanced rock in North Salem, New York. Um, this is the one that Barry Fell actually used as his prototype for uh, calling these things dolmens. Okay, here's another one in Ontario. Um, it's along a canoe route and it's pretty impressive. And this is also a long canoe route, a canoe route in a, in a close by area, but got the three uh, propping stones under there, the three pedestals. And again, along another canoe route in Ontario. So because, you know, you do find these sometimes along uh, Native American uh, or, you know, uh, Aboriginal uh, waterways, it does make you wonder whether if some of them were in fact put there on purpose, because it, it wouldn't be that hard to do. Um, so the question is, have some of these been modified, let's say by using levers to um, maybe improve the situation or add, a, add another pedestal? Um, it could happen, and it's hard to really say one way or the other whether it or not it happened. Some of them just look, you know, like they might have been manipulated, especially if they're near a known uh, landmark or waterway or something like that. So what are some angles you can use to try to help decide if you think that these were manipulated or not? Well. If the pedestals don't look like they show any glacial erosion, that might be a box to tick off. Also, sometimes these um, these capstones are supported by fairly precarious shims that, uh, you know, it's not conclusive proof, but it might indicate that the shim was placed um, by the hand of man. And also, as we were talking about, it. Um, if they are in areas, let's say near a council meeting area or a burial area or a trail junction, uh, it could indicate that maybe some work was done to at least improve the, the prop uh, or the pedestals or the propping. And sometimes there are alignments as well, let's say with, um, with a sight line on, on a uh, solstice sunset line or, or that sort of thing. So these things do occur. I don't think these fellows could actually live. I think they're just joking. But if they had a liver or two, uh, then they undoubtedly could move it. I've actually, in, in my own uh, backyard excavation, moved stones, not maybe quite this big, but uh, well, let's say half that size anyway, with just a, a pickaxe and uh, as a lever. And, and I've been able to move it around the yard. So I, I could have easily propped the other stones under it if that had been my objective. Okay, we're gonna look at another couple here. Well, this one's really interesting. Now, this one is actually underwater. Uh, it's in a lake. But the interesting thing is that um, around 8,000 years ago, it was on dry land. The, um, there was a, uh, a glacial lake that was blocked by a moraine. Uh, and so down river from that lake, this was, um, a, a uh, an area of, of uh, bedrock outcrop near the shore of a salmon stream. And it looks like somebody may have propped this one up uh, before the glacial uh, lake let go and it ended up putting making this underwater. Um, this was discovered actually by submarine in McDonald Lake in Hamilton Forest, Ontario. And you can see that some of the proppings, the, the shims in there, are, are really precarious. And uh, it does make you think that um, 
there's there is a chance this one was was manufactured. All right. What about pedestal boulders in Europe? Is there any such thing? Yeah, Europe was also glaciated. And we can, in fact, find examples of pedestal boulders in Europe. Now, they might not be as common uh, as they are in Nova Scotia. Um, that might be partly because people um, can sometimes knock these things over for fun. Uh, and uh, there's that might be one reason why you don't find too many of them. But in, in remote areas, you can still find uh, you can still find them. They do exist. This is the same one from a different angle. It looks pretty similar to the ones we're familiar with here, like around Piggy's Cove. Okay, so this one is, uh, is, is quite suggestive. Now, it seems to be pretty much natural as far as we can tell, but it does look an awful lot like some of the ones that we know were definitely manufactured. So, was this one of the ones that was improved? We're not sure. In fact, it's classified as a, a Neolithic sacred site. So maybe it was just used. Maybe it is natural and, and they just took advantage of it, or maybe they manipulated it a little bit. Hard to tell. But apparently there, it was used in uh, Neolithic rites. All right, so what about this business about dolmens in, in uh, North America? Is, is it a real thing? Well, Barry Fell, as I mentioned earlier, uh, tried to make the case for dolmens in North America. And so the, what we're calling pedestal stones, he, he felt that maybe they, they should be called dolmens. But most of them really have a natural explanation. So this, uh, this didn't go down very well with, uh, with the scientists. So the balanced rock is one of the ones that uh, Barry Fell drew, drew attention to. He felt it was um, very likely to have been uh, manufactured or manipulated into position. But I'm not so sure. It, it seems less likely to me to be a, uh, the case for this one being manipulated, I don't think is all that strong. The, um, the pointiness of these um, support stones is actually due to the fact that the uh, pressure of the capstone is, call, is causing spalling on, on the pedestals. So uh, that's why they have this interesting conical shape. So they're, they're, they're sort of being worn down just, just from the spalling due to the weight of the capstone. Here's another one from New England, this one from New Jersey, fairly famous tripod rock. Now, is this one natural? Is it manufactured? This one's pretty hard to tell, really. Um, I, I think you could make an argument both ways, but it certainly could be natural. I don't think you can rule that out. Now, there's actually a second tripod rock in New Jersey. This one, I think the case is a lot stronger that it might have been uh, built up on purpose with sh with uh, shims and and levers, just because of the structure of the, all the shims, they they don't look um, random or natural. They look they look like they've been placed. So, I think there are some cases where it was done. All right. So, what about dolmens then? What is a real dolmen? A dolmen is a type of single chamber megalithic tomb. And it usually consists of two or more vertical megaliths supported, uh, supporting a large flat horizontal capstone or table. Now, most of these date from the late Neolithic, 6,000 to 4,000 years before present, or the Bronze Age, which would then be roughly 4,000 to 3,000 uh, before present. Sometimes they were originally covered with a pile of earth and, and small stones to form a tumulus, which over the years uh, it may, may have washed away, leaving just sort of the uh, skeletal remains of the tumulus. Although in other cases, there may never have been a tumulus over them at all. Here's an interesting one from Cornwall. So if you've ever toured Ireland or, or Cornwall or Wales, 
Um, there are a lot of these. I, I made a point of trying to see as many as I could when I was over there. Um, the oldest ones that we know about in Western Europe are about 7,000 years old. They, they have lots of different names too. Uh, they're called quoets, cromlechs, megalithic tombs. In Portugal, they're called antas. And uh, in Korean, they're called goan dolls. But we're gonna look at some Korean ones as well. This one's from Ireland, very, very classic shape with uh, very thin plate-like support stones and a very thin plate-like table stone or capstone. So pedestal boulders of the Americas do sometimes look similar to old world dolmens, but it really isn't correct to call these uh, dolmens because they were never tombs of any sort. Now they may have had some other purpose. Some of them may have been manipulated, but we're never, um, we never see them as tombs. So we will call the North American ones pedestal boulders and we will not use dolmen as a synonym for that. This one is from Korea and you can see how similar it is to the uh, ones we were looking at from Ireland and uh, Cornwall. Um, now there's a lot of different types of dolmens in Korea and some of them, most of them were actually tombs, but maybe not all. This one is from Portugal and it's very, very big. It has a chamber associated with it. And um, if you, like, if you were to stand here, this, this would be um, the height of a normal person right here. This is, this is a huge uh, example of a, of a, uh, what they call antas or uh, dolmen. And uh, just keep your eye on this edge because in the next picture, um, my wife is gonna be in the picture and you, compare her, you can compare her to this edge of this stone here, which is, which is this, which would be right there as well. So it's this, and, and you can see the size of this capstone, which was originally over this part of the tunnel that leads into the, uh, main body of the uh, dolmen here. So this is truly massive. Here I am also in uh, Portugal um, underneath another one of these uh, dolmens or antas. And this one is, is quite uh, um, elegant as well with the uh, uh, very uh, upright um, pedestals and, and a very nice looking capstone. So they, they do have a variety of styles. Now we, we've, so far we've looked at kind of like the more classic style, um, but some of them do look a little more rugged. Okay, so here's one from Ireland and it almost looks natural. Um, you know, maybe not a lot of manipulation was required to, to build this uh, or, or maybe it was completely built up. Uh, we just don't know but it doesn't look all that different from the natural ones. So it's hard to tell, but apparently it was used for Neolithic purposes. I don't know if they found bones or artifacts nearby, they likely did. And here's another one, uh, this one from Ireland. Again, it's definitely a, a classic style, but it, it looks like maybe one side has collapsed. So it's starting to look a little more like the, the natural ones that, uh, that we're familiar with. Here's another one uh, also from Ireland. This one could be totally natural, but apparently it was used as a tomb. And so whether, how much work was necessary to make it into a tomb or whether they just used the natural uh, uh, perched boulder, pedestal boulder and, and made a tomb out of it, hard to say, but it wouldn't be that hard to, you know, manipulate these stones around into position just to get them the way you want them. Arthur's Stone, which is traditionally a tomb, um, and it is kind of stunning. It, it looks a lot like the uh, North Salem Dolmen, doesn't it? Here it is from another angle. Now, I think this might actually be part of the tomb as well. So whether you have a case of uh, an actual more traditional style tomb, and then the um, pedestal boulder, just um, used as an extra sort of uh, 
a monument to go along with the tomb or or whether this was actually natural and just sitting here and it seemed like a good place to put a tomb hard to say there's there's lots of possibilities arthur stone again from a different angle now here's another um, dolmen megalithic tomb from wales and it was obviously um, work was done on this but how much of it was natural hard to say I mean, it does look you know very similar to some of the natural ones we've seen so i i would say it's probably a hybrid you know with some natural uh, characteristics and some manufactured characteristics this is the same one again from a different angle and another shot of it another one from cornwall true dolmen definitely but um, pretty rough this one's a lot more elegant i think there's no doubt about this one being manufactured here's one from france and it's these were truly massive glacial boulders you can see how worn they were so they didn't have to be quarried but they were um, clearly assembled here into this uh, megalithic tomb and this is a different one but it looks it's from france but it looks very similar to that one we were just looking at uh, from wales it's the same one from a different angle and here's one from Germany. So yeah, the, these megalithic tombs are all over Europe. All right, this one's more controversial. I mean, it does look like a megalithic tomb, and, and people have identified it as such. The problem is it's on the Azores, where uh, it's very controversial whether there were ever any, uh, you know, people living there prior to the Portuguese moving in in the early 1400s. So some people say, yes, this is evidence that there were early, early humans in the Azores that in the megalithic age that built this and it might have happened. It might well be the case. I don't know. Uh, it does look a little bit similar, though, doesn't it, to that, um, that one that I pointed out from, uh, was it Upper La Have, I think, um, or, or, um, or Martins River. No, it was the one from the Martins River watershed, yeah. Uh, seems you know a lot of similar features visually so there probably was uh there's certainly some natural element going on here was there any manipulation as well possible hard to say for sure okay well this one's definitely had a lot of manipulation but it's <laughs> it's definitely striking so this is a, a megalithic tomb uh from sardinia and clearly the doorway was cut out of this slab so how much of this was manufactured it seems like it probably was mostly manufactured just based on the the angles and so on uh but a pretty impressive manufacturer that's for sure all right here is a box-like megalithic tomb i don't know if you can guess where this is but i found it quite surprising uh that it is located in the jordan river uh valley of israel so these things are truly found in a lot of places around the world all right and now we are in korea again so previously we looked at some korean dolmens that uh had a, a pretty classic shape similar to the ones you'd see in ireland but they're they have several different uh, canonical shapes or, or types uh, in Korea. And, and this is the type that they call the go table type. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not sure why there's go is a game they play. And I guess there's a table they use to play the game that for some reason reminds them of this style of dolmen, but it has a gigantic, almost cubic uh, uh, capstone and then really small um, propping stones underneath it, pedestals. Now this one's also from Korea. This is uh, more like the natural ones that we see in North America. Um, 
this might have partly been natural, not sure. I mean, the glaciers did reach this part of Korea. So did the early Neolithic man begin building these megalithic tombs uh, in imitation of natural cropped boulders that, uh, that were in the landscape? They might have, but uh, the Koreans believe that this one was, was manufactured. They, it's actually, this is actually the, on the grounds of the uh, Dolmen Museum, uh, which is an incredible uh, museum to, to go in there. And they have many, many exhibits explaining how the dolmens were made in, in Neolithic times. And um, yeah, it's a fantastic place to visit, highly recommend it. Okay, so here's another one. This is one of the other styles that they have. It's, it's more of a tomb style where you have a, a large capstone, but, but more of a flat capstone as opposed to um, the more cubicle style. And again, the propping stones are pretty small. So uh, most of these did have tombs under them. So, there are a lot of these in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, they claim to have over 30,000. And uh, they, they are even revered today. The Koreans uh, give them a lot of respect. Like I said, they have a whole, they have this whole museum and, and actually there's, there's a, at least another one. There at least two museums in Korea. I think there might even be a third. I, um, I visited at least two of them. I can't remember for sure if I went to the third one, but. Uh, yeah, there. It's it's worth checking in to these um, Dolmen museums if you happen to be in Korea. Okay, here's a diorama that was in one of the museums that uh, is attempted to portray and illustrate the method of building these dolmens. And so, the idea is that you have this gigantic capstone, and you get the high priest um, or barking out orders. And you get as many men as necessary with ropes until the thing starts moving. And then you use rollers to uh, reduce the friction, let it roll along. So there's a high priest giving the directions and they're moving the rollers, picking them up from the front or uh, picking them up from the back, moving them to the front so that it keeps rolling along. So that's how they say they were made. And then when you get it to where you want it to go, you can lever it into place. So for the um, vertical uh, stones, they would dig a pit and then between ropes and levers, somehow get the uh, pedestal uh, vertical members in the pit. And then they would build a big uh, tumulus over top of it. So then they could haul the capstone up on the ramp and put it into place. Then sometimes they would leave the tumulus there and then other times they would remove it themselves to just to leave the, uh, the classic pie uh, figure, letter, Greek letter pi, uh, pie style dolmen in this case. So table type, which is the same as the pie type. Um, and then it, it almost morphs into the go table type. Uh, this is the above ground stone lined chamber type. And this is the go board type. So, you know, there's sometimes it's hard to know how to classify them because it, the, the types kind of blend one into the other. But this is a very classic go board type or go table type. Uh, as they would classify it. And this one's all kind of borderline, I would say, but apparently also a gold board type. So these figures, are, again, were on display in the museum. I just took photos of them uh, while I was there. Uh, so it shows how the tombs were sometimes constructed under uh, these dolmens. And uh, so sometimes the capstone really did cap off the tomb and seal it. Other times the tomb was under there, but there was still uh, pedestal stones holding that capstone uh, above the tomb. So these dots are meant to portray areas where um, 
dolmens can be found in Korea. Uh, so there's some in North Korea and there's even some in China. There's even some in Japan. That's what this is meant to portray. So ready for some conclusions. True dolmens are indeed man-made structures from different parts of the world, dating to the Stone Age and the Bronze Age. The pedestal boulders of the Americas are generally the result of natural glacial processes. However, there may be a few pedestal boulders in the Americas that have been manipulated by the hand of man to one extent or another. I, I think it's pretty clear that some were, and we've, we've tried to look at maybe some of the more obvious examples. Um, it's very hard to take a given case and say for sure how much manipulation happened, how much was it natural, but it can be a fun exercise to, to try to analyze the available evidence. Uh, although it'll be hard to be confident about, about a conclusion, you know, to what degree manipulation took place in any one individual case. So that's what I had to present tonight, and um, I welcome uh, feedback or questions. All right, thank you very much, Terry. Uh, that was great. Uh, we have two questions and comments in the chat right now. Um, we'll go through those, and then if anybody else posts anything, we can read those off, and then uh, feel free to unmic and uh, turn off on your video if you would like to ask Terry a question. So the first uh, question comes from Stephen Lowe, and he was asking whether the petroglyphs on the stone, or were there petroglyphs on the stone near Mahone Bay? No. No? Okay. Uh, and then Matt Moore mentioned that Korea has an estimated 35,000 dolmens that have been recorded at this point. And he would like to ask, are there any man-made uh, dolmens in the Maritimes? Well, I think so. Um, but like I said, it's it's hard to say for sure. Um, I mean, I that one that I showed, uh, uh, maybe I can bring it back up quickly. Um, that was just outside Peggy's Cove. Uh, that one, I think you could make a pretty good argument to say that it, it was um, built, but um, you know you couldn't say definitively. Definitively, uh, you'd have to just state your reasons as to why this one look, uh, appears to have more evidence of being manipulated. I mean, it, it, it wouldn't be that hard to make anyway. So it's it's not as if you know you're you're saying a lot. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, I think you can find some where, where the evidence kind of points in that direction, but I don't think you can, um, unless, unless the person who did it admits to doing it, which sometimes happens. Uh, but short of that, I don't think you can say for sure. That's fair. Uh, Caroline Eaton asks, uh, dragging or propping large stones up on top of dirt, do we think this is how Stonehenge and other large structures were assembled? Yeah, that's right. It's, uh, it's easy, convenient, making use of those natural things. So may as well. Uh, we've got Gary Buttery who is asking, Terry, have you visited the Ohm tomb in Denmark near uh, Rukskilde? No, I've never been to Denmark at all. So yeah, that, that would be a, incredible to go there. Well, um, do you have a point to make about it, Gary? Give him a moment to respond, maybe. Okay, I am unmuted now at this point. Uh, can you hear me, Terry? Yes. Boy, it's good seeing you, and thank you for doing yeah, this. Too. Yeah, the Ohm tomb is uh, really quite incredible. I mean, the uh, stones, that the verticals are, gosh, 15 feet tall or so, and... Uh, it is covered, but it is. It was something that a local told us about, and uh, so my son and I went and visited it. Definitely one to go see. Okay, um, just trying to pull it up right here. Yeah.
Cool. This is the one, right? Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't. I've never heard of it, but uh, but yeah. So the you can go right inside and and see. Yes, you can. Through. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good tip. Yeah. Well, you should take a trip, Terry. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Um, Stephen Lowe asks, why are there so many cases, three stones propping them up in the case of the pedestal stones? Well, the thing is, if you have three stones, it may, it's like a three-legged stool and it's very stable. If there was a four stone there, chances are that one of the four stones wouldn't make a very solid contact with with the, the top and end up being washed away. Uh, so if you have more than three, it's it's kind of a fluke because that means that um, the four of them or the five of them, however many you have, just um, are exactly the right height to all make a good contact. That doesn't happen very often. So with three, there doesn't have to be any matching. Like three of any weird size, will all three will make a good contact. But to have more than three, then that's kind of a fluke because um, this, let's say the fourth or fifth one have to be exactly the right size to m make a good contact and, and match where the stone is propped by the other three. That makes sense? That makes sense to me. Um, so Matt Moore, I uh, was looking to have the Azores Dolmen photo up again, please. Oh, and Stephen Lowe responds, yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so Matt was thinking that, or believes that they recently found evidence of pre-European human presence in the Azores. And uh, right. it's fascinating considering the, the remote location that it's in. Exactly. Um, I. I'll just, since it's right here, show you the one from Martins River. And it strikes me how similar it is to the, the Azores one, which I'll bring up now. Where is it? Um, I must have gone right past it. Um, is that here? Oh. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's um, actually, you know, mounting evidence for megalithic man in the Azores. And, you know, I think officially it's still quite controversial, but um, I think eventually the case will will probably be made because evidence keeps coming coming up, as as you say. And they use similar sites like this as part of it? Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Um, do we have any other questions? Anybody would like to contribute anything? Oh, Johanna says, thanks so much for the interesting talk, Terry. Sorry to covered this. But have you come across any research suggesting that these being used as navigational markers in the Americas? Yeah. Um, well, they do often occur near waterways and um, you it's often been suggested that they were used to mark um, either places where the the trail had a turn in it or a portage location or a um, gathering point you know so various people traveling down the river uh, wanted all to, let's say, camp at the same place. So maybe one of these propped boulders or, or perched boulders was set up in order to be the sort of the sign marker as to where to uh, where to stop. Um, it's it's been argued that way. I, I don't know that anyone has really conclusively established that to be the case, but it is kind of uh, you know auspicious or strange how often you see these things in, in, in places like that. Um, like we've got one, for example, uh, in the uh, Purcell's Cove Badlands, 
um, or backlands, I should say. Um, I wish I had a photo of it, but it it's a very nice pedestal boulder, um, not too huge, about the size of a desk, I guess, but really nice pedestals and only about um, a few, you know, less than 100 meters away from it is is a, a clearing with with stones in a circle that really looks like a, a council spot, you know. So, um, you know, to me, in my mind, the two seem to be related, and and you do tend to to find that quite a bit. And so, yeah, I I think there's evidence for what you say. That's fair. Um, well, to continue that, I guess. Uh, Tom Burns says, what would you speculate the purpose to be of man-made if they were man-made pedestals or propped up stones in Nova Scotia? Oh. Well, I speculate that there may have been uh, a code to it, you know, as to, uh, I don't know what the code is exactly, but things like the number and size of the pedestals and uh, their orientation, it, you know, whether one stone propping up another one simply meant you know, watch for a, a junction in the trail and two stones propping it up meant for, um, you know, good place to camp or maybe three stones propping it up said, uh, you know, switch watersheds here. Who knows? I mean, I'm, I'm making this all up, but I think there may have been a language like that. Um, if, if, you, if you could only know what the secret code was, you may be able to figure it out, but I'm just guessing. Yeah, yeah, it can be hard to throw some of our thoughts back in time like that and kind of guess on those things, but do what we can. Uh, oh, uh, Carol Morrison was asking about the associated earthworks and could they have eroded over time? So we talked about the, the soil build up to, to build megalithic structures. Yeah, that is believed to be the case, and especially in the ones, let's say, in Ireland and Wales and so on, that um, they did indeed have... Um, piles of dirt over them originally, and that eventually uh, washed away. Not all of them had that apparently. Apparently some, in some cases, the dirt was was taken away on purpose, but in other ones, it just washed away. And you can uh, definitely find some today, even in Korea or like um, maybe Denmark and Sweden where the, the stones are still under the piles of dirt and the dirt never did wash away. Yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of like a, a half finished process. Mm. Uh, just while we're asking the next question, Carolyn Eaton would like to see this slide depicting the cartoon diagram of people dragging the stones up onto a dirt mound uh, in order to place it on top of the stones. She wouldn't have considered uh, the dirt being a building block for this, but it makes so much sense. Yeah, yeah, you can see there. Um, Gary Buttery was also asking, are there any megalithic tombs associated with the chambers in Newfoundland? Uh, oh, we're going, they're going in July and they hope to explore some of them. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, there's, if you want to go up to Elliston, uh, Newfoundland, you'll find like tons of chambers. It's like the chamber capital of North America. Um, but in terms of, um, these type of, uh, propped and perched boulders, um, you know, they're, they're I mean, I have seen a couple here and there, but nothing. I mean, they were, I would say they're definitely natural, the ones I've seen. Um, they don't seem to be all that common. I'm not sure why. But then again, I haven't really explored a lot of the wilderness of Newfoundland. I'm usually, you know, not far from the road when I'm there. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know of any, I, other than uh, inviting you to visit Elliston, um, I don't really have any other advice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, that's fair. Um, let's give another moment for any other questions that might pour in. Um, but yeah, other than that, that was a that was a wonderful talk. Thank you for for providing one this evening. It was great. My pleasure. Yeah, and uh, great to see and talk to uh, all of you folks. So, until next time. <laughs> Excellent.